Okay. So, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my name is Daniele, and this presentation is about uh, nearby threats, reversing, analyzing, and attacking uh, Google's nearby connection uh, on Android. This is a joint work with uh, Neil Stephenauer, which is the audience from CISPA, and Casper Rasmussen, which is in the audience somewhere. So, uh, what is nearby connections? Nearby connections is a public API that is available for uh, Android and Android Things uh, operating systems that an application developer can use to include proximity-based services in an application. An example of a proximity-based service application is a peer-to-peer -peer file editing uh, app uh, that is constrained the possibility to edit uh, a file only um, to the users that are, for example, in Bluetooth or Wi-Fi range. Nearby connection is implemented as a, in the Google Play services. This means that uh, um, it is available across a wide range of operating system uh, versions and multiple applications can use nearby connections as a shared library. We decided to analyze uh, nearby connections because of its uh, wide attack surface. Uh, a single vulnerability in the design or in the implementation of uh, this API uh, automatically affects all the applications that are using it, even across different operating system versions. The attack surface is also widened by the fact that this API uses complex wireless technologies namely Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, even at the same time. <coughs> Despite the wide attack surface, there are no public specification of nearby connections, and the implementation is done by Google. Uh, it is shipped in uh, most of uh, the phones that we have in uh, our pockets, but is closed source and obfuscated. The core contribution of our work is the first uh, security analysis of nearby connections, in our analysis, we uncover the proprietary mechanisms and protocol of the API, uh, and uh, the analysis is based on reverse engineering of uh, its Android implementation. We were also able to re-implement uh, nearby connections in a toolkit that we call uh, Rearby. Rearby exposes uh, low-layer parameters that are not available through the public API that is uh, provided to Android developers by uh, Google. And uh, we use a nearby to perform experiments where we are able to impersonate any nearby connection device from any Android application. Uh, we also present a set of uh, attacks on uh, uh, nearby connections, specifically connection manipulation and range extension attacks. Later in this talk, we will see two examples, two practical examples of, of this attack. And prior to the publication of this work, we did a responsible disclosure uh, with Google. So let's see what are the public information that are available about nearby connections. Uh, as you can see from the picture, we have two smartphones that are running an app that we call NC. This is a nearby connection enabled app. A smartphone is acting as a client and the other one is acting as a server. Uh, the server advertises a service and the client has to discover the same service. The client and the server to be able to connect, that they, they have also to use the same connection strategy. Nearby connections exposes two uh, connection strategies, peer-to-peer -peer star and peer-to-peer -peer cluster. The difference between the two is that you can establish different types of uh, topologies, and the peer-to-peer -peer prefix reminds us that this is a peer-to-peer -peer API that does not require internet connection to be used. This is the whole point of nearby connections. Uh, the client and the server, once they found each other, they uh, establish an application layer connection, and then they start exchanging uh, encrypted uh, payload. And the, the connection is established using a combination of uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. But at this point of the story, we, we, we didn't know uh, the details of the, of, of the evolution of a, of a nearby connection. And we, had to, uh, we decided to reverse engineer uh, its Android implementation. We used several advanced techniques. In this slide, I'm going to uh, present our dynamic banner instrumentation setup. So the client and the server are connected to a laptop through an ADB uh, Android debug bridge interface. The laptop is acting as a, a dynamic debugger. The workhorse of our setup is Frida, that is a free open source uh, dynamic binary instrumentation toolkit that we are using to uh, attach to the relevant Android processes that are managing the nearby connection application. In this case, we have the NC-app process and NC-GPS process. One is managing the application logic, and the other one is managing the low-level uh, details of nearby connections. Through this, uh, Setup, we are able to extract uh, a lot of information by observing the establishment of a nearby connection at runtime and through the Frida uh, JavaScript API, changing the instrumentation code that is exercising different uh, 
uh, code part of the, of the library. Um, now I'm going to show you a summary of the main results that we found after uh, our reverse engineer uh, stage. So the first uh, phase of a nearby connection is a discovery phase where the uh, server is changing its Bluetooth name and the Bluetooth low energy report value uh, to uh, some value that is in function of the uh, nearby connection uh, API. The client is then uh, looking for the, this specific value and is sending a, a connection over Bluetooth BR EDR. This connection is encrypted, but is not uh, uh, authenticated. Once the connection is established, then there is a key exchange protocol run at the application layer between the client and the server, and this protocol is used to um, establish a shared secret. This shared secret is used in an optional authentication uh, phase. This is application uh, layer uh, authentication um, based on the, on the shared secret. After the optional authentication phase at, at, at the application layer, we have the application layer connection establishment phase. This is an interactive phase where the client and the server are already connected over Bluetooth, but they want to connect at the nearby connection application layer. So both of them, they have to accept the connection. Once the application layer connection is established, then there are a set of key derivation functions that are run by both devices to compute session keys AES keys for confidentiality, and HMAC keys for message integrity. These keys are also based on the shared secret that was computed uh, during the key exchange protocol. Then there is an optional physical layer switch phase, because so far the, the, the connection only used Bluetooth as a, as a physical layer. But at, at this point, the client and the server might decide to switch to Wi-Fi. There are different uh, modes of uh, Wi-Fi, and later we will see uh, more, detail, more details about one of these uh, Bluetooth to Wi-Fi uh, switch, because this is uh, important to understand one of uh, the attacks that I'm going to present. Finally, the client and the server uh, can exchange encrypted payload at the application layer. At the, the application layer uses a keep alive mechanism that is based on a 30 seconds timeout. And finally, the client and the server can disconnect. So it is important to notice that we uh, reversed this uh, uh, all the phases of, of an airbag connection, but then we also re-implement all of this, these phases in our uh, airbag toolkit to be able to perform experiments and uh, attack. Now I'm going to jump into the details of the, of the key exchange protocol because this, this is one of the phases that was done right by, by Google. Uh, through dynamic binary instrumentation and uh, uh, packet dissecting techniques, we were able to uh, understand that the client and the server are using uh, a modified version of elliptic curve de Fielman on the NIST uh, P256 curve. As you can see from the picture, the client and the server are firstly are generating key pairs and nonces, then the client is computing a commitment over the public key, then there is an exchange of four packets. These packets are application layer packets that are sent over the Bluetooth link that is encrypted. So first of all, we have to decrypt these packets. And then we had also to reverse engineer the uh, application layer format that is used by, by nearby connection. And by reverse engineering uh, uh, the format, we were able to ex extract all the, the parameters that are exchanged. So for example, in cap three, the third packet, we can see that the server is sending to the client sequence number that is three and is uh, public key. The, in, instead, in, in cap four, the um, client is sending uh, is public key and the sequence number four. Another very interesting uh, uh, phase that we reversed about the air connection is the optional physical air switch. Basically, the server is instructing the client over Bluetooth on how to switch to uh, Wi-Fi. And the problematic part of this phase that in our opinion is not done, done right by Google is that the client blindly follows the, direct, the instruction of, of the server or, um, and switch to, to Wi-Fi. In this example, we see that the server is acting as a soft access point, and the client is uh, receiving the information about the soft access point from the server, and then is connecting to, happily connecting to, to, to the, this soft uh, access point. Now I'm going to present you uh, two attacks that we conducted uh, over nearby connections. The first one is a, a range extension man in the middle attack. In this attack, we have a scenario where the client and the server are running the same nearby connection enabled application, but they are not able to discover each other because they are out of range. Uh, 
But if the attacker is able to mount a man-in-the-middle attack, then it can redirect all the packet from the client to the server and back from the server to the client, even routing it through the internet. And this uh, uh, attack basically breaks the fundamental assumption that nearby connections are established uh, by devices that are in, in proximity. This is not a simple relay attack. We had to um, use our nearby toolkit to, uh, to implement and establish two parallel sessions, one from the client to a malicious server, and one from the server to the ma malicious client, and then we are able to tunnel the packets through internet or through whatever. We, we can also tunnel them through a satellite link, because the problem of nearby connections is that there, there are no proximity checks in place. There is no distance bounding. The only countermeasure that I think it is not a countermeasure is a 30-second timeout that uh, enforces the proximity of the, of the device. Um, the second type of attack involves a manipulation, a direct manipulation of a nearby connection. And this is the soft, soft access point manipulation attack. In this attack scenario, we have a victim that is connected to the internet through a legitimate access point. And we have an attacker who owns uh, two devices in proximity with the victim, a laptop and, and, the, and the rogue access point. Uh, the victim then starts his nearby connection application as a client, and uh, he wants to connect to, to a nearby device to, to, to use this, this service. Uh, the attacker is able to impersonate a legitimate server through our, our nearby toolkit, and is able to establish a nearby connection uh, over the, the Bluetooth link. Uh, when the, the attacker establishes this, this connection, is, is performing actually all the phases that we've seen before, like the key uh, derivation functions, the key exchange protocol, and uh, uh, it is able to, to talk and to speak the same uh, application layer protocol of a proper uh, nearby connection device. This means that the attacker can also influence and manipulate maliciously the physical layer switch. The attacker can send cra a crafted application layer packet to tell the client, hey, why don't you switch to this uh, access point with this ESSID and password? And this means that the uh, client will blindly follow the directive of the attacker, and it will end up connecting to, to the rogue access point instead of the proper one. And this is a big problem, a very big problem mainly for, for two reasons. First, the attacker has arbitrary power on the configuration of the network interface of the victim. This means that the attacker can push a new default uh, IP route to the, to the client. The attacker can also push a rogue uh, DNS uh, IP address to the client. And uh, even worse, with this attack, the attacker gets access to the wall traffic coming from the client. The, and it is important to note that this traffic does also include uh, packets coming from other applications that are not even aware that nearby connection is uh, in use, right? So if you, with your uh, smartphone, you connect with, to my nearby server, uh, I can redirect you to a rogue access point and I can get access to your emails, your browser uh, packets, everything. And this is just by abusing nearby connections. And nearby connections is uh, enabled uh, and available in most of the Android and Android Things uh, phones uh, worldwide. Uh, in conclusions, we, in this work, we are presenting the first security analysis uh, of nearby connections. Nearby connections is an, a public API developed by Google to enable proximity-based services on Android and Android Things devices. We reverse engineer its Android implementation, and we re-implemented it uh, in a toolkit that can be run on a, on a commodity laptop that we call Rearby. Uh, through Rearby, we are able to perform several attacks, uh, range extension and soft access point manipulation attacks are just two examples of uh, attacks that I have time to show, but you can have a look at the paper to see uh, more attacks. And also, if you want to try the soft access point manipulation attack, you can uh, look at this uh, link in the slide. You can download the, all the, the material to reproduce the attack on uh, your, your phone. Um, thanks for your time, and I'm happy to take your questions. Question? Uh, hi, uh, this is Joe from UC Irvine. Uh, so since I 
uh, listen to the previous talk and your talk, and I think last talk talks about uh, range-based authentication. So my question is that, is it possible to apply the idea of last talk to address uh, your, your problem here? Or well, it's like, a, like a, I mean, different kind of uh, tracks of research. Yeah, well, well, I guess that it's not directly applicable because the other talk is talking about a modulation scheme that applies to different types of wireless systems. Hi, Xiao Qing from Indiana University, Bloomington. And I want to know the main difference between the nearby connection and Apple's, for example, L-Job, this kind of zero configuration connection. Yeah, I'm not super familiar with the Apple side of things. I know that, for example, AirDrop mm -hmm. that is implemented by Apple yeah. is using uh, similar uh, mm -hmm. technologies, so combination mm -hmm. of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Mm -hmm. But I, I, unfortunately, I, I didn't have time to have a look at the, the technical details. Yeah, do you familiar with the uh, Auckland paper in 2016 to study the attack on like Apple's uh, zero configuration? Okay, I will yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So I have some questions also. Uh, yes, please. Um, so what, um, what is the reason that um, a device, a client, would switch to Wi-Fi automatically when the server instructs it to do so. Yeah, this is, this is the policy that is implemented in the, in the library. So this means that we, we don't have access to the source code of the, of the library because it's obfuscated. But this means that at some point that there might be an if statement saying, if the server is sending you this, then do that. Then you know, uh, switch on your Wi-Fi antenna and connect to this Wi-Fi network. So when you t contacted Google, did you get any response? Yes, we, we got some, some responses, and, uh, but we are not super satisfied by <laughs> the responses that, that we got, but they, they, um, they addressed our, our, our problems. Okay, and uh, one last question. Uh, yeah. Were you able to, um, so the, does the attack require any user interaction? Let's say if I'm a victim, I just walk around with my phone. Yeah, this is a good question. So no, because you have to activate nearby connections once, because this is a service that is available to all your applications, right? So you, you activate it once, and then, uh, and then on, in the background, your phone is, will start discovering devices, and then that's it. Then the attack can be performed. OK, thanks. Let's sure. thank the speaker again.